Namaskaram. Good evening to all our viewers today. And welcome back to the Earth series, Candid with the Gantasalas. Today we have a very eminent pioneer in the field of medical research and practice. It is none other than Dr. Anantakrishnan Sivaraman, who is a consultant urologist, a uro-oncologist, and robotic surgeon at the Chennai Urology and Robotics Institute. He specializes in minimally invasive robotic surgery and uro-oncology and is a national proctor of the robotic surgery in India, running a fellowship program for robotics, as well as one of the ro few robotic surgeons in the world to have performed a robotic renal transplant surgery. And he has several publications in, which are peer-reviewed in journals and served as a managing editor for the Journal of Robotic Surgery as well. He has authored several books and is also um, the faculty of the University College London Robotic Center for the Advanced Urological Robotic Course, as well as the faculty of the Society of Robotic Surgery. Dr. Anantakrishnan is the founder director of the Indian Prostate Cancer Foundation, an organization dedicated to the alleviation of suffering from prostate cancer in India. Today, we are going to be delving into several such topics of robotic surgery, prostate cancer, and many more, along with Dr. Anantakrishnan. Ananta Krishnan Sevaraman, and we are very happy to have you with us, sir, today. Welcome to our show. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. It's a pleasure to be on your show. Thank you. Am I uh, audible enough? Yes, sir. I think you are. All right. Uh, good evening. Good evening. Uh, and I've been hearing a lot about the work that you've been doing. So um, it's a pleasure to be on the show. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Doctor. Thank you very much uh, for being with us. We are curating Earth series uh, to motivate from anxiety and stress. And we are very happy to be with you today. Robotic surgery, it sounds like science fiction. And how far are we from reality? Can you explain? <laughs> So I get asked this question a lot of times uh, by a lot of people, especially patients who come into us. Uh, it's, it's, you know, actually robotic surgery is not new. The first uh, robotic surgery was done in the year 2000. And now we are in 2020. So it's been about 20 years since uh, the first surgery has started. So whenever we talk about uh, robot and robotic surgery, especially in Tamil Nadu, everybody talks about this movie, Rajinikanth movie, no? Indira, the robot. So everybody talks about that sort of thing, but it really is not uh, something that uh, can happen on its own. So by even though when you know when you think of it, it, it's like it operates on its own and stuff like that. Currently, as it stands, robotic surgery means a master slave mechanism, which means whatever the surgeon does gets translated in, inside the patient's body. So the robot um, cannot do anything on its own. So number one, people have to understand it's uh, something that the surgeon does. So it's called robotic surgery. The main goal of this robotic surgery is it's somewhat similar to laparoscopy, but it's probably a hundred times more advanced. So tiny incisions are made and then um, tiny instruments are put inside the patient's abdomen. And uh, when we operate outside, it gets translated inside. So we don't have to put our hands inside. So, which means the incisions are much smaller. And a, because small incisions, the pain is very, very minimal when we do the surgery and patients get up and start walking in about um, four to six hours after surgery. And they can go home in 24 hours after uh, surgery. So again, a massive advance compared to open surgery and uh, further advance when you compare it to laparoscopic surgery. And it's not new, you know, in India, we've got 70 robots now, uh, but I'll give you another example. For America for 330 million people has got more than 4,000 robots. India for 1,000 uh, or 1 1.3 billion people, we've got only 70 robots. I think there's a long way for us to go, uh, but you know, because the technology is slightly more expensive, uh, India is a bit slow to catch up. But eventually, I think it will be there in most parts of India, and a lot of people are going to benefit from it. So my work 
especially is uh, dealing with neuro oncology which means cancer related to the kidney bladder prostate and so on and this um, robotic surgery is fantastic surgery to perform for prostate cancer especially so again i'm 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 straight away gone into a lot of uh, technical stuff i'm sorry for doing that so <laughs> no, no no problem doctor <laughs> I think you took us in the oh, go ahead go ahead sorry it's it's basically uh, in, an interface between the surgeon and the patient so what we do outside happens inside i'm i'm sure a lot of your viewers are interested in what we're going to show that i would direct them to our uh, curie hospital website it's got a lot of data about robotic surgery and some videos as well so you're more than welcome to see that sure and we were actually you actually pointed us in the next question that we already had um just based on our research like we were looking at the mm -hmm. surgical robotics in india growth uh, there were several uh, publications and one of it was each device cost like 1.5 million us dollars yeah. and the cost of running each device is also each treatment is more expensive so the more surgeries through robotics it reduces the cost per surgery as well but is this something that as a individual person there's only so much you can do but uh, is there any initiative by the government to promote robotics to promote doctors who are who specialize in robotics so that the reach can be uh, the reach can go to the masses yeah that's a wonderful question and thank you for asking that so number one is when you look at a country like ours india we're not a very rich country you know we don't come under the rich country category uh, and we're still considered the developing country and we're progressing towards uh, those goals so when you look at uh, a country like ours the government probably is focusing more on uh, basic needs of the people so for instance if if uh, uh, so many people have the need for robotic surgery so the empty number of more people would need basic surgery so you know that at present the government's undertaking a two pronged approach a lot of uh, initiative on the basic surgical side and then they're trying to focus on specialized centers that's one of the goals that uh, the government has brought in where uh, all india institutes are being created all around with access to robotic surgery and so on so again any country just can't focus on one part of it but for a country like ours it's going to be difficult to focus on robotic surgery and that's where the private sector has come in in a big way so if you look at the robots in india most of it is in the private sector and biggest limitation as far as i, I as, as, as as far as i can see is uh, buying the robot is not a big problem a lot of the corporates can afford the robot but training a surgeon to be a robotic surgeon is a problem so for instance i had to go to the us to get myself trained i spent quite a bit of time there and then came back to india but we don't have that number of fellowships running at the moment uh, in india so even you know we've got 70 robots but we don't have 70 fellowships running where people can get trained in robotic surgery so that's a big big problem so we've got a lot of self taught robotic surgeons and and uh, a lot of times you know it, the time it takes for a surgeon to be uh, a competent robotic surgeon is going to take a long time unless they are fellowship trained where actively they train every day in robotic surgery and then they go back to practicing so good question we need a lot of training centers for robotics Doctor, you're, I, I don't know if you had a look at our questions or not, but you're again asking us <laughs> the next question that we had. Uh, several doctors, <laughs> like you, uh, so several doctors are young doctors are going abroad to get trained in robotics and stuff like that. But one of the problems that, again, another research paper came up was, yeah, you do have a lot of doctors taking up robotics abroad, but not many of those doctors are coming back to India to actually practice this year. And that's exactly what you also brought up that like, yeah, we do have 70 robots in India itself, but you don't have that many doctors. What, what, what is the underlying thing? Is it just the opportunities or is it the awareness? I don't know why. Um, so, um, so the, the, you know, you're asking why surgeons who train abroad aren't coming back, isn't it? So yes, when, when it's still so booming here, like you, the growth opportunity is so big in India where you have only 70 robots where, where the US has so many thousands of robots, at least the growth opportunity should be enticing, right? I think it's a no brainer. People should come back to India to get after they get trained and practice their trade here, to be honest, because we have 1.3 billion people and we're booming right now. So India is the place to be. 
whatever uh, people might say you know initially the life is good there and uh, you know uh, yeah, when you go there uh, the training is good I, i'm i won't deny that in fact one of the best places to train would be america right now because the volume in robotic surgery especially is exceptionally good there so i trained in an institution that would do 1000 robotic surgeries per year and there's no institution in india that does that number at present so um, again the volume of training is fantastic there but uh, you know i i wouldn't be able to say why a lot of people aren't coming back they should that's the honest answer because uh, india right now i think we are about 10 years behind where the us is right now in a lot of things but our growth potential is far higher you just have to um, look at our country's growth over the years compared to the western world i think india is going to be an amazingly fantastic place to practice in another 10 years even now it is very good place to practice but um certain organizational difficulties infrastructural difficulties if i may put it like that uh, are bound to be here you know uh, number one is the insurance in india doesn't cover robotic surgery at present but the government's made a huge effort in this to make all insurance companies accept robotic surgery so that you know by next year i think most of the insurance companies would accept robotic surgery and that in turn would make a lot more hospitals by the robot because there's a definite advantage when you compare it with open surgery when you compare it with the laparoscopic surgery and for certain cancers when you compare it with the radiation robotic surgery is far better so i think it's a no brainer in a matter of a few years there's going to be a huge boom in india and trust me on this a lot of doctors are going to come back here to india so. very nice you brought something uh, wonderful to india you would have faced roadblocks how did you overcome the stress and anxiety while you were doing all this definitely it's a great stress for you i honestly in in terms of stress um, uh, the biggest stress that uh, we as doctors face sometimes especially when you're working in oncology which is a cancer related field is sometimes when you have to give uh, less than good, less than perfect news to the patient regarding their cancer regarding their prognosis that causes a lot of a lot of heartache uh, to us you know because we we have to we always empathize with the patient and uh, when they faced with the uh, not so perfect news about uh, prognosis and so on it it that causes a little bit of stress but otherwise work wise seeing patients every day i think it's it's actually a stress buster if you ask me <laughs> yeah uh, we really enjoy doing what i do and then every day in the hospital is like um, uh, how do i put it uh, you know um at the some point in time where uh, you really want to you 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 in fact my uh, my father's a doctor as well so in these corona times i had asked him to stay at home he's 74 years old and i told him appa why don't you stay home and he said when i need it i will be living there so you can stay at home because as over a period of time we really enjoy going to work every day and then seeing patients and then sharing in their um, experiences and helping them out it really makes a difference i would call it a stress buster not really a stressful uh, period but uh, for to answer your questions we have uh, had to jump through several hoops to uh, come to where we are at present and we probably need to take it as part of our life experiences i wouldn't call it specifically stressful there are uh, certain periods when it was stressful for instance moving from here to a new country and then setting up a uh, house there family there and so on it was a good experience uh but we had to adapt and adjust so i think whenever uh, we faced with some change uh, there's a little bit of uh, stress that creeps in but other than that i think we've been pretty okay so uh, you have evolved as a medical student surgeon consultant urologist and now as a director how was your journey and tell us about uh curie hospital also now yeah. so that's like my life history in one single question <laughs> but anyway i um uh, so 
I am my I'm family of doctors. Uh, so um, my father and mother were both uh, um, um, doctors. Uh, my grandfather is Dr. P. R. Balakrishnan. And uh, he was also a uh, doctor, he was a surgeon, and he was also dean of uh, Madras Medical College. So, and both my father and mother studied in Madras Medical College, Dr. Sivaraman and Dr. Manamalli. And um, so throughout my schooling, um, you know, there, it was just like uh, this, you have to become a doctor, doctor, doctor. <laughs> so I probably didn't have a choice, I think. But uh, to be honest, um, I didn't personally prefer to go into any other field other than this because every day and in, in the dining table you would uh, get uh, you know my father would my father continuously is capable of talking continuously so uh, he would every day come back home and tell this happened in hospital this happened in hospital so we always grew up with this um, you know you need to go and do that huh? so i was my schooling was in uh, don focus. bosco and yeah focus and uh, those days we you know this this uh, these days my daughter at 12th standard knew what she wanted to do she said appa i want to do economics and then she chose economics and she's studying in warwick university in the uk but those days i didn't have that big of an idea that i should become an engineer or an economist or a lawyer or something like that the medicine seemed to be the most logical path and i chose it uh, i chose it and i'm absolutely happy with that decision and a lot of that came from my mother. You know, from a very young age, she would say, "There's this. Uh, you have to become a surgeon. You have to become like your father." And actually, she, when I was younger, she wanted me to become a cardiothoracic surgeon. In those days, that was that used to be the even in the surgical field, that used to be uh, one of the top fields. So she always said, "Anand, you have to be a cardiothoracic surgeon." So, so on. So anyway, 12th standard was like. Those you know nowadays people are talking about need so much. Those days also it was tough, but it was I think you know uh, my mother was uh, hugely instrumental in me becoming a doctor. And I was too playful at that day. I had no idea uh, you know I would I would if she let me for a minute I would run out and play start playing. So <laughs> she, but for her I probably would have been uh, goat herding or something somewhere. So. Uh, <laughs> So she made me a doctor. She would uh, every day, uh, you know, in fact, I remember those days. She probably took uh, about six months off from her work. She was a professor of uh, biochemistry in Madras Medical College. And she took time off from her work and then um, made me uh, uh, a doctor. So uh, I joined uh, Madras Medical in 1992. And I must say, it was a fantastic college. Uh, Madras Medical, to be honest, mm -hmm. was exceptionally good those days. I, even now, I think it's, it's an amazing place to be. And um, um, life was uh, exceptionally good. So, um, so about five of our classmates from Don Bosco joined Madras Medical College. So we were friends from uh, kindergarten to final year MBBS. So, so and they're all doing amazingly well at this uh, point in time. And then uh, once we finished college again, it became a big... Please, madam, you wanted to ask something, yes? <laughs> there is a question for you. <laughs> there is a question for you, whether you were studious or playful <laughs> by Shiva Chidambaram. Ah, yes, yes. Sri Gai Chidambaram sir was asking that question. Yeah, so he knows me uh, when I was in uh, medical college and when I was doing uh, my uh, MCH in neurology in Madras Medical. So he was... Uh, he was he was our assistant professor at that time when I was a student, and then uh, we had uh, you know so he's such a nice person to work with. But anyway, so he's asked a specific question: Was I playful or studious? So in once you join medical school, I think uh, whether you're playful or whether you're studious, what needs to be done at that point in time was always done. So there's no question about uh, being too 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 playful and not uh, studying. And once you're in uh, medical college so um uh, so again uh, medical college was just it just was a whirlwind the five years we didn't know what happened one day we joined the uh, first year mbbs and then anatomy was there new classmates and new friends and so on and then finally at the end of five years uh, 
it just went off like a whirlwind. And there's uh, no question of, uh, uh, there's a huge um, amount of information that we had to process. It was that I would rate it as one of the most enjoyable periods of my life. So studying in medical college, new friends, and amazingly uh, good amount of information. And what they taught us more than anything else was, you know, because we were in a government hospital, all kinds of people would come to us. And we had to empathize with each and every one of them regarding their problem. You can't just see a patient as a patient with some clinical signs and symptoms. So there's so many important things that we would learn. You know, I remember one professor saying um, when, I, when I, we were uh, probably when I was a house surgeon, I, I addressed a patient and said that uh, patient with chest pain. Uh, and then uh, he was very cross with me. He said, uh, it's not a patient with chest pain. That's not his name. He is, uh, he is Mr. Dorai, he's got a wife, he's got a child, he's got uh, two children. And you should address him because if you just address him based on his clinical condition, you won't learn to empathize with his uh, personal situation. So there's so many things that were inculcated in us in that college. Uh, I'm eternally grateful for what I've learned. Uh, and uh, this has stood a long way in, in our life as well. You know? So every day when we see patients, it's not just looking at them as a as what is the problem, but we have to look at them as a family, what they're uh, going through, what sort of stress they're having, and so on. So that I think is uh, is probably something that uh, it just automatically comes when you when you go through the gates of MMC. Uh, probably a lot of other medical colleges as well, but this is something that I you know sticks with us. And then uh, general surgery, uh, after finishing um, uh, uh, medical college, then we, there was again a big question whether you want to do surgery or medicine or something like that. So uh, I had an opportunity to go to uh, the US at that time because my um, Parima Pai and my Anandan, my uh, Parima son, uh, had gone to the US. So he was, uh, he he'd call, called me there and said, he's already joined, he's one year senior to me in Madras Medical. And then, so he said, just come over and then we'll be okay. And so I, I had half a mind to go there, but my mother uh, said, uh, you know, you're better off, uh, you should probably stay in India. She didn't let me go. I was a bit cross with her at that point in time, but uh, you know, it, it all worked. Some, uh, I joined surgery here again in Chennai and then finished surgery. And then once I finished surgery, Again, there's this big uh, question mark. What specialization should we do? Whether it's urology or plastic surgery. By that time I was married. My father-in-law was a plastic surgeon. My father is a urologist. So both of them are saying one father-in-law said, take plastic surgery. Father said, take urology. <laughs> so, again, <laughs> so again, there's big, uh, uh, difficulty at that point in time. So these, these are, the, you know, probably some things that uh, I had to share. So those days we had entrance exams and I wrote the entrance exam for uh, urology. So urology had three seats in the open category and then uh, uh, plastic surgery had much more uh, higher number of seats. So I came fourth rank in urology. So I didn't get urology, but I got plastic surgery. So, and then, uh, you know, so, uh, so so, and plastic surgery again, uh, even though I got it, because I didn't get urology, I, I thought I should study for one more year and then get uh, urology. So again, uh, he probably, uh, um, you know, my father, father-in-law is a fantastic man. So they're running a hospital in Coimbatore called, called Ganga Hospital. Um, so, and, and he's one of my, one of the persons that I look up to as well. But somehow I preferred urology rather than uh, plastic surgery. Uh, but one of the other things that I forgot to mention was, uh, you know, you asked about Madras Medical after joining first year. You know who my professor of biochemistry at that time was? My mother. <laughs> so my first year teacher in biochemistry, my mother. So it was such a nice feeling. So I usually used to sit somewhere in the middle to the last row. But when her class came, I would just come to the front row. And, <laughs> and when I joined the Madras Medical College again for uh, uh, urology, MCH in urology, next year again I got through entrance exams. Uh, my father was my professor in urology. So, so 
mother and first year and father in mch so probably a very 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 lucky guy uh, in that aspect very strong and, foundation uh, <laughs> yeah i must say so uh, and uh, so he had already been, so my father is again a hugely important uh, person in my life because i've modeled my career my uh, the way i think the way i see patients a lot of what he does is uh what i'm doing right now so my sister often calls me as the pale imitation of my father so um you, you know uh, you probably would have been better off asking him to give you this interview <laughs> but anyway so uh, he he was my teacher and then um, and then once we finished urology he'd already gone to the U uk when he was uh, young and then i i was also in the uk for some time with him so uk seemed a natural logical progression so i went after i'm finishing my mch in neurology we went to i went to the uk and then in studied in the university college london and uh, passed a fast case neurology so at that time 2006 it was 2006 7 uh, went to a conference in uh, uh, in glasgow in the uk and then they had they had kept the surgical robot there the da vinci robot So for everybody to sit and see how it works and so on. So that was my first time on the surgical robot. So and uh, it was amazing, you know, that experience sitting on the robot and thing. So I decided there and then to uh, study robotic surgery. But unfortunately, in in England, the options were limited to study robotic surgery. So we had to. I had to go to America to study robotic surgery, and then for that we had to. write exams to pass the american you know american america had, had this usmle exams at those time so i was pretty old at that time you know at 31 or 32 i think uh, and for some me to study what i studied back in mbbs was probably very very difficult thing to do but because i wanted to learn robotics i really made an effort and got a fellowship there and went off to the us so how have i grown so these the pathway was uh, kind of you know other than studying i didn't have any um, you know studying and passing exams and the exams were a bit stressful and so on nothing major the pathway was okay but when when i had to go to the us and all again studying basics and all was a bit difficult but the most important challenge came when i came back to india so you you studied well you had, had a skill set that very few people in india had but when you came back translating that into practice was uh, altogether different ball game you know nobody would come to me because uh, uh, just because i got robotic surgery there or so again that was a lesson that i learned very quickly so as soon as i came back i thought you know because because you studied so well you got so uh, trained well patients would come flocking uh, but actually no that wasn't the case <laughs> i was at up i was uh, joined apollo hospitals uh, then i was uh, heading their robotic surgery program but you know i had to spend a lot of time and effort to make people understand what robotic surgery is a lot of people would come in and then when i said something about robotic surgery they said vana sir nanga nanga routine paathukrom appadi poiduvanga so that was something that we had to challenge we had to fight that was one of the biggest challenges making people understand what robotics is and how the outcomes are and so on you know and what i found was um, doctors came to us first because they could understand the advantages of robotic surgery for so the first few patients that i operated here in chennai were doctors themselves so once the doctors came in slowly patients started coming in um and and uh, this is what uh, made a huge difference you know so patients became advocates of robotic surgery and then the word of mouth and then uh, had a lot of uh, help from uh, the corporate sector as well so people got to know what robotic surgery is and that made a huge difference so suddenly our numbers the first year was i was even you know like you asked me why did i you, when you came back was it easy and it was very difficult the first year i had several doubts in my mind i did did we come back was it a mistake uh, because i was working there every day and then when i came back the first year i didn't have a lot of practice then a lot of people didn't know what i was doing 
So I was doing general urology, not uh, specifically robotic surgery or urology. People didn't realize that uh, this was there, available, and it was expensive technology. So again, that was a big trouble. But then we got through that, and once it picked up, we wanted to start a hospital that could uh, allow the surgery to be accessed by a lot of people. So, and one of my strong beliefs, especially you know, because. Uh, my father-in-law has a similar model in Ganga Hospital in Coimbatore, which means that we shouldn't turn away anybody who comes to us for help in terms of uh, surgery or something like that. So, so the best way to achieve that would be to start a center of excellence and to scale up uh, volumes. So with volumes comes efficiency, comes our ability to vary our costs based on the patient's needs. So that was one of the main goals of starting this uh, Chennai Urology and Robotic Institute. And it's been two years since we started. We were also a fledgling uh, hospital. And uh, um, you know, hopefully, we'll go from strength to strength. I, I, did I, you, you know, I, I'm probably rambling for a lot of time. Sorry. To <laughs> No, no, I think we're getting a lot of good uh, comments. No. People are actually very enjoying. Uh, very interesting. Yeah, people are enjoying what you're saying. We're getting a lot of comments as well. Uh, doctor, one of the key questions that we've typically heard, like people have heard of a oncologist, people have heard of a cardiologist, people have heard of a pediatrician, but urologist, um, it's not very common. Like, and you know, in, uh, with, in the Indian context, people are very shy. So they're never going to think of a urologist in the first instance. And we have a lot of uh, friends, relatives who had uh, infections and stuff, and they're still very shy to go. Can you give some tips as to when someone has a problem, uh, how do they identify, like, okay, especially from, from a urologist, which is like, I wouldn't say neglected, but uh, less thought of uh, from a public perspective. What are the symptoms that people should be aware of okay. and think I should think of a urologist? A very nice question, but when you say less thought of, it gives me some chest pain. <laughs> so, <laughs> like people in at least you know, is like the first, like anybody has oh, this is the heart problem. I get the point of it. So, so number one is what is uh, who is the urologist? So, in a, uh, so the body has uh, the kidneys. The kidneys. The main job of the kidneys is to take away uh, bad products from the body and push it out through the urine. So kidneys, then the bladder is a storehouse of uh, the you know re uh, receptacle where the urine is stored, and then urine comes out through the via the prostate. You know the pathway uh, is covered by the prostate and the urethra and so on. So this system, the kidneys, bladder, ureta, urethra, um, prostate, is basically what a urologist looks into, right? So and what are the commonest problems? So both men and women. Anything to do with the kidneys would probably be the urologist, especially the surgical aspects. The medical aspects of the kidney can be looked at by a nephrologist, but the surgical aspects will be looked at by the urologist. For instance, kidney cancer, then stones in the kidney stones, uh, bladder stones, ureteric stones, and an infection. So let me give you a quick idea as to what we're doing. So if you take women, especially the women from their 20s to their 40s and 60s, uh, 50s, the commonest problem that they come to us is for urinary tract infections, right? So that's something that uh, all of this is something that's managed by urologists, right? So when, um, you know, let's use this as a small um, um, way in which we can uh, disperse some knowledge to people as well regarding UTI. So when, when women get urinary tract infections, the commonest uh, misconception is Sir, and I, I went outside and used some other toilet, and that's why I got a urinary tract infection and so on and so forth. So that's not why people get urinary tract infections. Urinary tract infections come from our own body. So the, from the body, you know, from the back passage, the infection comes and gets into the bladder. So I'm going to give you five tips. Uh, when when uh, women get urinary tract infection, number one thing that they have to do is drink a lot of water and pass a lot of urine. So, uh, because you're trying to flush out the infection, right? So, most of the infections come from our back passage. So, when we wash ourselves, the, the direction is always from front to back. So, that's how it should be done. 
Number three is undergarments should always be in cotton. And uh, number four is that people have difficulty passing schools, constipation or stuff, stuff like that. That should be treated. And this, the final one is very, very useful for women, sexually active women. Uh, after intercourse, they should always pass urine and then only go to bed. Because during intercourse, bacteria uh, is somehow propelled into the uh, bladder. And then, um, you know, it cause, can cause an infection. So that's very common. So if you take women, urinary tract infection is the most common reason they visit us. And then um, kidney stones. Men, women, both of them have kidney stones. Men more commonly. So these kidney stones are something that causes a lot of pain. So they're formed in the kidney and then they push down in the ureteric tube and then they come out through the urine. When they usually, when they're small, they can come out. But when they reach a reasonably big size, four millimeter, five millimeter, then they can get stuck in the passage and cause a lot of pain. So this pain is one of the most severest pains that you can get. And patients are usually writhing in pain and so on. And, and that can be very easily treated. Nowadays, we've got tiny cameras that go through the passage and we can laser the stone and powder the stone and come out. So that's another common infection, a common problem that we get. Next, when you take men, um, about the age of 50, a lot of them get problems passing urine. And this is one of the reasons they don't, they know, they, they don't come to us. A lot of people think it's because of age and so on. A part of it, it is because of age. But uh, a lot of times, you know, when you, when you go to the restroom, when you go to the toilet, it doesn't come out immediately. It takes some time for it to come out. Or the speed, which was initially very good when you were uh, younger, is now slowly coming down and you pass it uh, very close to your legs and so on. So again, frequency, you get up uh, you get up so many times at night, you throughout the day, you seem to be passing urine and there's some burning and so on. People are very shy to talk about this, but if they come to us, we can very easily give them a solution. Most of the times, all of this can be managed with medication. So it's not like you really need to, you know, you know I, I see this in a lot of patients who come to us. They don't want to bring it out and tell us. Another thing that I usually get is uh, people with blood in the urine. So again, if there's one point that I want uh, people watching this interview to, watching this talk to uh, take home is, if there is blood in the urine, they need to immediately see a urologist. It's no, in, especially in Nambur, like people talk about in the Sudu, Abdullah Sildan. You know, I didn't drink water, so there was blood in the urine or something like that. So that's not acceptable. Urinary passage can con only have urine coming out. If blood comes out immediately, you should come. Because, you know, I've spoken about urine infections. I gave you an idea about stones. I told you about prostate enlargement causing difficulty in passing urine. But if there's blood in the urine, it can mean cancer. Yes, cancer. So if blood comes in the urine, our goal is to find out where it came up, uh, from and why did it come. So. It can come from kidneys, ureter, bladder, prostate, anywhere. So our goal is to find out where it came from. So, if, and especially smokers, you know, now we've uh, proven that smoking causes cancer. It's written big letters. It's written in the packet. Huh? You know, smoking causes cancer. But a lot of people still do it. I don't know why. Hmm? So now, every time a patient comes to us, so I make it a point to tell them, listen, guys, it's written in the packet. Make sure you read it before you go and smoke. So one of the commonest reasons for, especially for urologists seeing cancer patients, especially bladder cancer, is uh, smoking. So if at all possible, avoid smoking. And there's this concept called passive smoking. If you're sitting next to a person who's smoking, you have you probably are ingesting a bit of the, inhaling a bit of the smoke as well. So that's not acceptable. So again, passive smoking, don't do that. Don't sit next to a person who's smoking. So that's again important. So this is generally what a urologist would do. So cancers of the kidney, ureter, bladder, prostate, and then uh, big prostates causing difficulty passing urine, kidney stones, urinary tract infections. These are the commonest stuff that we do. And also infertility. So a lot of uh, people, male, uh, men uh, after marriage are not able to have kids and so on. So if they're having difficulty having children, that's probably something when we would look after that part of it. And uh, erectile dysfunction, you know, that's very commonly seen if in, uh, in this part of the country, especially uh, because we have a hospital, Curie Hospital is in OMR Road. A lot of software engineers come to us 
and you asked me about stress uh, in, the, in the beginning i think these young kids in software industry seem to have an amazing amount of stress mm, i don't know why maybe it's their work pressure maybe it's um, difficulty you know they they have deadlines to meet and so on huh? so and a lot of them have this erectile dysfunction so if they're not able to have erections properly and so that's something that a urologist would uh, look at as well so i hope that answers your question yes i think that was very very informative and thank you for the points i think uh, it the whole point of having earth is to share this kind of meaning awareness to our audience so thank you so much for that there are a few uh, people who are asking questions why don't you read it out sure so uh, how can we contact you for appointments from india or abroad so so you we probably need to go to the curie hospital website chennai urology and robotic institute and they've got a, a list of ways in which you can contact us i would direct you to that uh, website and a tele tele consultations available as well so we probably need to uh go to the curi website um are there laws to govern the manufacturing using maintaining robots by the government ah that's a very nice question so uh so in india uh the robot so, so currently in india how we are working is if any uh, entity is placed inside the abdomen or stays inside that needs to be regulated but if if uh, an instrument is used for surgery but doesn't stay inside is not that regulated so a lot of organizations hospitals um, for instance robotic companies are starting out by putting their robots here in india uh, but the current robot that is available at present has been there for 20 years now and it's gone through various regulations and most of the robots that are sold are uh, fda approved which is uh, the american uh, organizations that's responsible for um credentialing or uh, going through the robots uh, specifications to make sure that it's safe to use so most of the robots that have fda approved are currently being sold in india so i don't think there's a worry in that um but the government is introducing a new bill or law and it's probably coming next year so that india itself can regulate the robots within its within the country that is interesting uh, we, we do have few um, audience they are actually sharing their medical records with us live right now but we are not going to share that for uh, on, on the public forum so uh, apologize yeah. to the audience who are sharing your public mm -hmm. records uh, please do not do that we do not recommend that um, yeah so w one of the other uh, important topics that we were we wanted to touch upon was prostate cancer and uh, cancer is a very deadly or uh, silent killer um, and we ourselves had uh, you know very close relatives passing away very suddenly in a short span of time because of cancer so the, the awareness of prostate cancer i know you you you're doing a lot of significant work around that you set up a foundation um could you share some insights for the audience like on w what is this thing and uh, what is the awareness you are creating and and the work of your foundation very good uh, very good question so what is this thing getting yeah what is cancer so basically you know in in our body we've got billions of cells in our body so usually what happens these cells they bond they multiply uh, divide and then they you know they finally they die okay the cells so if a cell forgets how to die and it constantly multiplies and that's what is basically cancer you know if a single cell forgets how to die and it's continuously multiplying and it can't stay in one area it probably needs to go to uh, different uh, areas and 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 uh, takes over the body finally so that is cancer number one number two is prostate cancer uh, cancer arising in the prostate which is uh, an organ uh, present in our body and it probably straddles the urethra behind the bladder and is very very common cancer that happens in men above the age of 60 most of the men probably have some enlargement of the prostate and then potential for prostate cancer is there and uh, what are the symptoms number one is i told you difficulty passing urine frequency urgency 
and then uh, blood in the urine uh, and and uh, burning and so on all of this probably points out to some problem in the prostate which can potentially be prostate cancer as well can we find out early whether a person has prostate cancer yes there's a blood test called the prostate specific antigen right and this blood test has the potential to tell us whether a person is has having cancer prostate or not and i would advise anybody above the age of 45 uh, to 50 every year you should get a psa test done so i was practicing in america for about 4 years learning robotic surgery and so on and one of the uh, biggest things that i found out there is if 100 people walk into a clinic 80 people had prostate cancer at a curable state now especially when you talk about cancer if it is only in that organ of origin so for instance prostate cancer only in the prostate it is more or less curable so kidney cancer in only in the kidney is curable but if the cancer goes to other organs organs beyond the prostate or organs beyond the kidney or something like that then it becomes very difficult to cure so if we detect it early then it's curable so this is something that i want to project cancer detected early is more or less curable especially prostate cancer kidney cancer all of this is early detection is curable so this psa test prostate specific antigen tells helps us uh, detect the cancer early so what was the difference between america where i was practicing where 80% of people who came in had curable cancer versus when i came back to india we had if 100 people with prostate cancer saw me 80% of cancer was not in the curable state so all of them had cancer that had spread to different parts of the body so they came late to us that was the reason why it had spread so the same surgeon the same robot the same technology same skill set available in india but we're not able to help that many people and what was the difference between the us and here was very simple awareness so there is a tot in tamil we call it vidhi punarchi so in the total lack of awareness regarding what prostate cancer was or generally what cancer was you know, because even in masteral checkups when i came back in 2010 12 i did 2012 people were not doing this psa test so and slowly start getting was getting incorporated in the masteral checkup so that was one of the biggest challenges we faced and that was a uh, uh, to inculcate this um, habit even among doctors so if the patients didn't know that psa had to be done for, uh, for detecting prostate cancer that's you know that we need to work at that but a significant segment of doctors we had to push to get the psa test done because in india the commonest treatment for prostate cancer was a non curative treatment uh, was given at those days you know they would do orchidectomy and then people would go back and then they would live for 5 6 years after that and then they would die so in india at 65 70 was considered a good age to die you know when i was studying I, when i was studying uh, medical college uh, that was what was in, but now people are living longer and, uh, and if we don't give them a curative option we would be cutting short their life span So again, this is one of the biggest challenges. That was why we started the Indian Prostate Cancer Foundation. Right. So the goal of the foundation was to prevent is to prevent needless suffering because of prostate cancer. And like I told you initially, to train doctors one regarding prostate cancer. Number two is to start the fellowship. This is one of one of our goals. Now, not only it's important detecting prostate cancer early, but we also have to have the wherewithal to treat them. treat them with the best possible treatment robotic surgery alone is not enough i alone do robotic surgery is not enough so we need to have more people doing robotic surgery so that more people are being helped more patients are being helped so that was one of the reasons we started the ipcf to start this awareness number two get in more patients for the treatment and train more doctors to be able to perform robotic surgery so more patients are helped so that was the goal of the indian prostate cancer foundation um i hope that answers your question yes doctor that does um so i think uh, we have a question please discuss your foundation and volunteers of ipcf ah, yes so so the foundation has uh, 
so for uh, we've done more than about thousand thousand uh, five hundred people have had uh, gone through our uh, robotic surgery program with uh, prostate malignancies and so on. So we have we run a support group for the patient. So whenever as soon as the patient hears the word cancer, there's a big uh, you know the family is around them and then the the cancer word has such a bad connotation that. people who gone through the program who had a good outcome if they are around them and if they talk to those patients it's, it's not only enough if a doctor advises how a patient or how the cancer is going to progress what are the treatment options and so on it's also very important that a patient who's undergone the same procedure or who's undergone the same sort of cancer and uh, come out uh, as a survivor if they talk to them they'll feel far better so Indian Prostate Cancer Foundation has Indian Prostate Cancer Support Group, and uh, we've got a lot of volunteers coming into that who've already gone through this progress to advise and handhold patients who've had a new diagnosis of cancer. So that's some of the. So every month we used to meet uh, in uh, Curie Hospital, but now because of the pandemic, um, uh, the support group is not happening. Uh, but uh, we're trying to, to do this in in an online manner and so on. So. that's that's something that the foundation does every every month i think it's it, it's wonderful that you don't just focus on the medical treatment but also the supplemental factors of counseling and uh, the support group which plays a huge uh, impact on the positivity of uh, the patient and the patient's family around them that's a very important point positivity like you said huh? so that's the key difference that makes uh, a huge and that's what makes a huge difference in the outcome for the patients the attitude of the patient is also very important and uh, our goal is to hand hold them throughout the entire process from the time they get their diagnosis till the time they're completely cured so that is you know it's not just they come in they get the surgery done they go out but overall not only the person or the patient but also the caregivers you know the family immediate family they have to be taken care of you know in in curie hospital we also run this uh, dementia care foundation that's a pet project of my wife where dementia patients who come into the you know we were diagnosed to come brought in to the hospital from morning to evening they're engaged a neuropsychiatrist evaluates them and then we look after them from morning to evening and send them home so for little children you have this kindergarten crash where they come in and their parents when they go to work they leave them and go but these dementia patients are like that so they're like children they forget they they don't uh, remember what they've done and so on so dementia is a disease that more than affecting the patient affects the caregivers you know so we have to look after the caregivers and the patients when the patients are with us for a, for a while it's a little bit of respite for the caregivers so that's one of the pet projects of uh, curie hospital especially this is run by my wife uh, gayatri anandakrishnan but i'm so proud of that project because it, though it doesn't align uh, with our primary goal of uh, urology but i think that project alone has such a huge beneficial advantage to the people who make use of it so again that's something that we're very proud of that's wonderful uh, and these uh, urology related issues are they mostly i know you mentioned like above 60 years for men but do children also have this is there like a pediatric uh, issue as well we also look after pediatric urology patients and uh, um, uh, you know those sort of patients are usually it's, it's a congenital uh, uh, problem for the heart so they born with certain difficulties uh, certain malformation anomaly and so on that can be corrected very easily with the available technology a lot of that is found out in prenatal antenatal scanning nowadays but and they they have potential to correct them so we follow them up regularly and then if it needs correction we can take them up for correction but uh, some of them because you know we've got patients from all over a lot of them haven't had antenatal scanning and so on and they're coming from other states tamil nadu is very good at this uh, antenatal treatment and antenatal uh, mothers are looked after very well in tamil nadu but a lot of people coming from other states probably the children did not uh, had scanning and they come with uh, Lot of anomalies that needs to be looked into. Wonderful, and uh, I mean, so I'm a young parent. My I have a daughter who's five years old. Uh, but like, is there like any points that you would give parents, like younger parents, uh, 
what should we look out for in our children boys and girls so oh, i i i i think um, very simple i you get this question a lot how much water should we drink so for adults it's it's uh, very simple so every day when you pass uh, water when you pass urine the color of your urine should be the color of uh, uh, champagne or clear very clear it shouldn't be very dark yellow which means it's concentrated urine so the color is should be very very light yellow champagne color or probably water color if that is the case then you are uh, drinking adequate amount of uh, water so depends if somebody is working out in the sun for 6 uh, hours 7 hours a day their water intake needs to be very high you know we get sweating and so on but if somebody is working in a software industry sitting in an ac room from morning to evening they don't probably need that level of uh, water intake so again it's it's for each individual and the best way to assess is the color of the urine that you are producing children again is is very simple basic hygiene a lot of people that i talk to um in in especially uh, young kids um they they don't bring the foreskin down and wash uh, the penis so that's something that we should teach as parents we should teach uh, young kids that we should bring the foreskin down and wash it how much ever it allows so bring it wash it and push it back in again so that's a very important thing to teach uh, young children uh, girls i find uh, young uh, girls are usually uh, you know they 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 try and have this uh, thing where they don't pass urine often you know they would kind of uh, control it for a long periods of time and then um, that in turn has a potential to trouble them at a future date so if you have the urge within reasonable limits go and pass urine as soon as possible right so um i you know i I've, i've been talking about myself uh, and my thing all this time but i should also talk about uh, you guys so so the uh, initially i i didn't uh, the first time i heard about uh, gantasala sir was uh, I, i'm part of the rotary club uh, rotary club of madras east and um, um you know there there's uh, our rotarian uh, mr surendra is there rotarian surendra and his uh, wife is shanti um, which is probably it was uh, mr gantasala sir's daughter so once we were in a tour in kashmir and there's this uh, uh, shanti madam was singing amazingly well huh? i did not even have a clue that she was uh, you know that's her daughter and so on so i was like eppadi ivula nalla paadringa ninga and uh, um, you know she uh, and everybody looked at me saying you didn't know avrina so i didn't know i didn't know she was gantasala's daughter and uh, uh, I, that was my first introduction i've always listened listen to his songs you know there's one song aha in benilavanile huh uh that was an amazing because i used to kind of uh, be humming that song all the time but you know only now i realized that it was sung by him so i i read up a little bit about him he was uh, he passed away in 1974 and i was born only in 1975 so uh but it, you know, it's such an honor to be uh, part of this uh, talk show especially such a illustrious person and your family members are taking it uh, to the next level so it's amazing to be part of this uh, program and uh, you know i looked at all the previous uh, some of your previous uh, interviews and so on especially dr sevagad aksham <laughs> so he spoke to me a couple of days ago and said uh, uh, hey anand I, i i think you are doing this interview very good i mean so uh, anyway thank you so much for this opportunity i must thank you and and madam parvati madam i saw her uh, in, in that um, you te- taught uh, my neighbor's daughter and i was i came for the darangetram it's such a nice program that you have done so you are teaching more people than i am at all. i've got two or three followers i'm teaching every day but you you teaching a school of people huh? <laughs> amazing madam amazing huh? i met you i met you in in a wheel uh, um conversation so i was so ah, impressed yes. I, i really wanted you to come to kala pradeshni and we have lots of friends 
like Roja Kandeya Morli, all my mm-hmm. dancers, Padmini Dorraj is your um, uh, yeah. relative. So many yeah. of them have, are watching our show. Thank you very much, viewers. Uh, we are very, very happy to meet you, doctor. Thank you, ma'am. So Thank you. Advice, we will definitely take it up. I hope all the viewers also will. It's very interesting. It's very interesting and informative too. Thank you very Thank much you. for being with Gantasalas. My pleasure. And, uh, as <laughs> we'll all meet you next uh, November 1st with another eminent personality. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, no, I think we've covered all the questions right now. So thank you so much, Doctor, for also answering our doctor's, uh, <laughs> our, our audience's questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Thank you so much.